David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, the founder of the highest paid part-time job in the World Options Trading Academy. And we're not necessarily going to talk about options today, but we will talk about the market and the desire for profit. And that's kind of how we're going to better roll this into something that's going to be market, I would say, relevant. What we're going to talk about is the profit incentive to lie to you, right? And what I mean by the profit incentive to lie to you is that often when somebody's communicating a message to you, you want to ask yourself, what is their incentive to create this message to me? And then you want to try to check the validity or verify some of what they say because they may have a profit incentive to lie to you. And we've seen this time and time again in the mainstream. We've seen this time and time again in media. And it's really a byproduct of the society that we currently live in today. It's much easier today to access media platforms than it ever has been in the history of the world. So then therefore you have more actors trying to use the media to craft a narrative and often the narrative that they're crafting is not 100% correct. And people used to blame mainstream media for this. However, now we have independent operators doing this. So we're going to talk about a person who's presenting themselves as a political candidate for the, I want to say, what is it, the 2024 election uh, named Vivek Ramaswamy. I believe that's his last name. However, in my opinion, he's creating a lot of false narratives, but Vivek has a lot of things in his background that don't really match up to what he's telling you now. It doesn't mean that people can't change over their life. But what it does mean is that he's not really giving you the full story around how he became to be he, who he is currently now today. But it's very interesting that he claims to support specific ideals. And there's something behind that in our opinion that we believe is going on. So here's my overall premise of what we're talking about. Vivek is creating a narrative on instructions from a guy named Peter Thiel. Now, you may not know who Peter Thiel is. He's a billionaire. Um, some people call him venture capitalist. Some people call him an investor. But he's a billionaire. He's worth almost a little under $5 billion. And he's the reason why you currently are seeing a lot of things that you're seeing currently in the media, but also in the tech space currently today, right? Who desires to reshape the political conversation on the right? What we're seeing today is that on the right is that what they're doing is they are financing vehicles to shape the, what the public thinks about things. So let me give an example. Years ago, there was a guy named Rush Limbaugh, and he did, quote unquote, political conservative political radio. Well, nobody was behind Rush Limbaugh giving him money to say certain things. And people may not believe that, but Rush, when there was no money in political and conservative talk, he was doing conservative talk, Right. Then he built himself up to where he now could take on sponsors, but many of his sponsors were product sponsors. But Rush was on mainstream media. He was on terrestrial radio. He was syndicated all over the country. But there was no billionaires behind Rush Limbaugh handing him money to promote certain things that I am aware of because he had sponsors and he was able to get syndicated deals for his show. So he didn't need to take anybody's money. What we're seeing on the right now is that you have really successful business people. And what they do is they create political action. They create, um, you know, media platforms because what they're trying to do is shape the mind of the public. And they know they can't do, you know, what we call terrestrial or old school television. It's very, very expensive to do television. It can be very expensive to get on the radio. You have to try to figure out how to get syndicated. You got to be letting the certain markets. There's a lot behind that, not just politics. But what we can do is take advantage of the internet, take advantage of social media, and we can use that to now get into colleges, get on different platforms, and shape the mind of the public. So what they're trying to do is create a narrative for the public to where they now think certain things about how the world actually works. Because what do they know about the, the public? Most people don't read. Most people don't study. Most people let somebody else tell them what is going on in the world because they don't want us to take the time to do it. We talked about we got 130 million Americans that read a sixth grade or below, but those people can still go vote. And so what you want to understand is that this is easier to do than ever has been done in the history of the world, because it used to be if you wanted to shape the mind of the public, either you had to be a pastor of a very big church. You had to get on television. You had to get on radio or you had to be in the movies. There was really no other way to do it. You maybe could do it through print, but then again, you're stuck on people having to read. 
and those particular platforms was gatekeep very hard. Now, because there's so many media outlets out here now, there's such a demand for content. If you can just drive eyeballs, people will ask you to be on their platform because they're a slave to the algo. And the algo supports the people that can get the most attention. Next point. Vivek is an actor playing a political candidate. And so I think this is really my overall narrative. This guy's playing a political candidate. He's not a legitimate political candidate. But we're in a world where it's easy to speak confidently and loudly and people think you're correct. Vivek is not a dumb person. We're going to kind of show you his educational background. There's nothing dumb about this guy. He's a very intelligent person. He's proven it over time. So he's been able to observe the world that we live in, where people who are really less intelligent than him were able to become very, very successful as long as they spoke very confidently and very loudly, even though they were 100% incorrect about what they said. Because why? We got 130 million Americans that read at sixth grade or below. So they don't even have the ability to research what somebody's telling them. Then most people surround themselves by people that only tell them what they already believe. So you can say something to somebody could be 100% correct, but if they believe it, even though it's 100% correct, they're never going to say, well, you know what? Let me research what I think about this. That's too much work. Right? What I just want to do is have somebody tell me what I want to hear all the time. And even though my life isn't really working that well, it doesn't matter because I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And he's been able to play into that. So if these less intelligent, less academically accomplished people, you got people that's real big in the, in the conservative political space and they went to college because they just knew how to tackle people real well. They don't have any real academic vigor about them. And you can hear that when you listen to them talk. Right. You have a person that wanted to be an actress and that didn't work. They went to the left side. That didn't work. And they went to the right. And then they're using their acting skill to be really big on the right. So Vivek, being a very intelligent person, realized that I can come in and use my academic background as an entryway into these particular spaces, use that to root my authority, use my business background to root my authority, and that I can be 100% inaccurate, I can be 100% incorrect about what I'm saying, but the standard has already been set that I don't need to be right. I just need to be loud and confident. And that works to people that, are in, that don't have confidence, Right? So, you know, if anybody that understands the faith side, how many people that you know go to church but don't read the Bible? Everything that they understand about what they say they believe comes from somebody else's mouth. It don't come out of the word because why? I don't want to sit down and read the Bible. I want somebody else to tell me what's in the Bible. So this happens in every lane, right, where you can influence and persuade people because you're influencing and persuading the laziest of the population. OK, so that's my particular narrative. Now, everything that I'm telling you, right, uh, make sure I put this disclaimer, right? All my comments on my opinion should not be regarded as fact, right? So I'm doing my Tucker Carlson. If he can do it, I can do it, right? I can come up with a narrative, come up with an idea, and nothing should be regarded as fact. It's all my opinion, right? So we're going we to play the same game that they play. But we've done research on Vivek to kind of really understand what do we think his real motivation is. We talked about, to me, this guy was put forth by Peter Thiel. We're going to talk about why we think Peter Thiel is doing this. But he's not a legitimate political candidate. And we're going to go into some of the reasons why. Now, what we're going to quickly go into is some audio, but really some some really some video, but really some audio of him. And we're going to break down some of the things that he's saying, because we talked about before. The reason why these people work in society is because the majority of people in society won't ever fact check anything. And I'm not saying a person has to be 100 percent correct about what they say. I'm not 100 percent correct. But what I'm not trying to take advantage of is the fact that people are uninformed and they don't read to get over. That's never been my game. My game has always been trying to empower people to make them more informed and to put the pressure on them to educate themselves and elevate themselves mentally and psychologically. It's never been, I'm going to go out here into the mainstream and I'm just going to tell people something because I know they're going to bite on it. Right. And I know they're never going to, you know, really investigate what I'm saying. It's the same thing with the people that claim that they're doing investigations. I'm not calling this dude a scammer. I'm not calling this dude a grifter. I don't use those words. Most of y'all don't know what a grifter is because you, you're you square. You don't know what a grifter is. You're a square. You've been a square your whole life. But the internet allows people to take words that come out of certain communities and just run with them. I'm not calling this dude a scammer. I'm not calling this dude a grifter because he's definitely not a grifter, right? He doesn't come out of that lifestyle. What I am calling him is somebody that is playing a political candidate. 
when he's not a legitimate political candidate. And I'm saying that he's creating a narrative that really contradicts his own life. And because nobody has looked into his own life, they're buying into, here's another person telling me what I want to hear. Right? Because we live in a world, and this is what hurts most people when they try to trade, is they want to be right even to the point to where they'll lose money. Because being right to them is bigger than, than, than making money. So the markets just beat they behind. Because why? I want to be right. I will see myself lose money just to try to prove to everybody I'm right. Right? Instead of cutting their losses and, 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 and coming at the market from a different angle, I'll just stay in a losing position just to try to be right. Because most people are motivated when they wake up in the morning to prove they self right every day. Let's go ahead and get into these videos. Yes, I, I do. Um, so I, I've heard a lot of, you know, what you think and your vision. And I am I'm a very practical person and I want to kind of oppose sure. to talking about your opponents. Let's talk about you for a moment and let's actually talk about your policy. Um, explain to me your position on this civic duty voting. Sure. So my position is I think that every kid who graduates from high school should know the minimums about the country that we require an immigrant to know about the country in order to become a citizen. So there's a test. My mom had to pass it. Every immigrant has to pass it to this country that asks you some basic questions. What are the three branches of government? What branch of government does the US president lead? Some basic questions about what is the Bill of Rights? So real quick, before we get into it, I forgot to remind you, if anybody can tell me what the 20th Amendment is to the Constitution, I give you a $5 cash app, right? Tell me what the 20th Amendment is to the Constitution. If you watch the whole video, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So really quickly, I forgot to put that out there. If anybody can tell me what the 28th Amendment is to the Constitution, let me know. I'll cash up you $5 before the day is over with. All right, let's get back to the video. It's like a multiple choice exam or some of them you write in. I think that if we're going to ask immigrants to pass that test, as we should, I think every 18-year-old who graduates from high school should have to pass that as well. Because young people, it goes back to that issue of pride. You don't value a country that you don't know something about. You don't value something you inherit. You value something you have a stake in creating, in building, or knowing something about. So, so how do we think big about this? Well, young people, as I told you, most of them, very few of them vote as it stands today. Super small numbers. And apparently 60% of them say they would rather give up their right to vote than give up TikTok. Well, I say, all right, let's take that to the next level. How about we do something that raises the voting age from 18 to 25, but you still get to vote at 18. Mm -hmm. If you just pass that same civics test that an immigrant has to pass in order to vote. And tests aren't for everybody, so so be it. Then you at least serve in the military or a first responder role for six months. <laughs> That's my civic duty voting proposal. And, and, and the, the reason is, I'll actually make a prediction. I think youth voting in this country will... Okay, so really quickly, 152, we talked about people making like, being able to pass a test. So you can't vote at 18 now, but you should have to pass a test, right? Or serve in the military or wait until you're older to pass the test. Now, I know where this narrative comes from because I know what this guy is. This isn't a new narrative, right? But the question we want to ask and the question that should have been asked in this particular show is that should you be eligible to be drafted, right? You're eligible to be drafted at 18. That's called a selective service. So should I be eligible to be drafted at 18, but I need to pass a, a test to vote at 18? So when I went to um, register to vote. I also had to register for selective service. I went to the post office with my mother. I did it. So I registered to vote at 18, but also had to register for selective service. So what he's saying is that you shouldn't be able to vote at 18, even though the government says that you are an adult at 18, right? You're a legal adult at 18. He wants to extend that unless you pass a test or you do six months of military service, and then you're allowed to vote. But my question they should have asked is that, well, is the person supposed to sign up for selective service at 18 but not be able to vote? Because then what you're saying is that the military can use you, can literally conscript you into their service, but then you aren't having the ability to vote. Well, what was the problem with us 50, 60 years ago? Is that we could get conscripted in the military service under law, but we couldn't vote. See, so when people talk about Ali and his stance against the Vietnam War, what they don't talk about is the fact that he was being drafted but could not vote in the state of Kentucky. 
and and the federal government would not enforce his ability to vote in the state of Kentucky. Right. But see, they they created so much of a of a distortion field around what he was doing. But really, he was in an environment to where the federal government of the United States will not enforce my right to vote in the state of Kentucky. But they're going to draft me into the military. Right. But then in my own state, I'm a, a citizen of the state. I can't vote. So then why should I join the military? But essentially, that's what he's asking for. So then what they should have asked is that what well, then what happens to the selective service at 18 for men? But the Breakfast Club, to me, their audience is really not that smart, right? I know their audience. I know the type of people they have on. They're not a show for people to me that really are intelligent. The hosts really don't know anything about politics. Envy knows how to make money. He's a very financially successful guy. Charlemagne has done very well for himself. But they don't really understand anything outside of, like, how to entertain people. So, again, it's easy for this goat, this guy to come on his this type of show and say a lot of things, and they don't even know how to ask him questions around what he's saying. So until they brought in Tez Figueroa, and she started asking him questions that so many people got upset about, but see, she comes out of the political space. I may, would, I may have done things different than her, and you're going to hear it, but nobody on that show really had the understanding of how to question this person properly around anything that he was saying. So he's able just to come into these environments, talk real loud, be real confident, but be wrong. And they don't even understand how to even deal with this type of person. Let's get back to it. Skyrocket after from a very low level right now, it will skyrocket because you value something you actually have to earn. And I think that this is not a left wing or right wing point. We all have duties as citizens, right? You know, we, we, we aspire to free market capitalism, right? OK, so we want to stop there. Again, there goes a free market capitalism lie. So you, you, you have to understand these people are running a script. Literally, if you look at like all these people on the right, right, the left is we're going to talk about the left later. But look at all the people on the right that really big in media. They all kind of run the same script. They all kind of have the same talking points. They all kind of say the same things. It's almost like they all came out of the same school or university. And I really think they did. I think behind closed doors. There's a group of people training these people what to say, right? They get they get the, all their media training from the same uh, organization because they have the same talking points they hit again. And they're using these talking points just to get out a response out of you. Then if you say something, they say, well, you know, you don't like capitalism. What I would say is, well, how do you define free market capitalism? Because free markets and capitalism really are opposed to each other because capitalism is about controlling markets. Capitalism doesn't desire free markets. Capitalism has anything to do with freedom of a market. That's not what capitalism is about. Capitalism is about control. It's not about freedom. So I would ask you, well, how do you define free market capitalism? What I wouldn't allow him to do was to give hot button me while then he could turn around and say, well, you're against capitalism. So if you wonder why these people, no matter where they go, they pretty much have the same talking points. They're running the same script. In my opinion, it's because they're coming from the same people. There must be an organization somewhere that teaches these people how to speak in media. It just tells them just hit these particular points and that are hot button people. And then you can get the reaction you want to try to prove your point, because his goal was to get exactly what he wanted to get out of this show, to get a negative reaction. So he now can run back to another audience and say, see what happens when I do yo, 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 yada. They can't deal with, quote unquote, debate. Right. And so you got to really understand the game that's been playing. Let's keep going. Materialist advance. And that's the life I've lived as well, by the way. I, my parents came to this country with not a lot of money. I've lived the American dream. I've made a lot of money by building businesses. That's one side of what it means to be an American. But part of it is we also have duties to this country. And I think the more we wake that up, actually, the voting age only became 18 in 1971 in the context of the I, Vietnam draft. So I just so, think reviving so those asking, ideas would be you're different. Asking a lot. So what, let's, let's, yeah. let's prove your point. Nick, our camera guy, do you know the three branches of the federal government? over 24, so it don't but, matter. But, but, but I'm you saying, but nobody knows they have 24. Red, do you know the three branches? Exactly. Well, that, well, I got a test. I got a test. I would, I would like to see if you're willing to pass, um, because I believe in just as you believe in civic <laughs> engagement. 
I, I believe in changing the ideas of what political opponents so look like, what should what they should look like, or political candidates. Uh, are you willing to take a test with me quickly? Because I just have a couple of questions for you. I will. Uh, so, absolutely. So just, <laughs> and the way this is opening up, I have a feeling I'm about to fail it. But that's good. Let's, let's do it. That's, that's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, just for clarity, I am independent. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. Cool. I think that's important for the premise of the argument, because I know you did a lot of debating at, at Harvard. Uh, it's also I also want to make it clear. These are the same questions that I asked a liberal Democrat, Marianne Williamson. So I want to make sure that we put that out there as well, just Fair to kind of set the foundation. I'm for the open test. to being humbled. Let's do this. OK, great. Let's go. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you know, the pride of being an American and how important it is uh, to have pride in this country. I'm also a veteran, uh, by the way, uh, for the United States Air Force. So when is it that you voted for the first time? I voted in 2020. OK, so you're how old again? I'm 37 years old. So for. OK, so really. So that's one point you want to jump out. 353. So he voted. He's 37 currently. That's what he says his age is. He voted in 2020 when he was 34. And that's his personal business. But it's interesting that now all of a sudden at 37, he's inspired to be president of the United States. But he, he wasn't politically active until 2020. So this is what I'm saying is that this person being allowed to hit all these different platforms and nobody asked these type of questions from him is very unusual, right? But like I said, is that these platforms are slave to the algorithm, they're slave to view, so they can't ask these kind of questions. Because see, let me give you a really quick example of why Breakfast Club did what they did. The Breakfast Club primarily is a music entertainment platform. And so what they do is they allow entertainers to come on their platform and to spread all kind of foolishness and whatever. Because let's say I represent a group of entertainers. They come in the breakfast club. Well, let's say one of them comes in the breakfast club. They have a bad experience. I can tell the rest of my entertainers, we're not doing the breakfast club no more. But if I have hot entertainers, the breakfast club wants my people on their platform because why? Wow, that's good content for them. That makes them look good because they're a platform. So what the breakfast club normally does is let entertainers come on their platform and just say all kind of nonsense. And they never push back on anything that they say because why? Wow, we need people to come on the platform to make the platform valid. Because if nobody comes on, then we don't have a platform. But because he's coming out of the political space and he's not really somebody that their audience really would even listen to, it doesn't matter what happens with this dude. So that's why Tez was able to challenge some of the stuff he says because it doesn't matter if he never comes back because their audience doesn't care about this guy anyway. Their audience is really there to hear about entertainment and music. But he, you see, she's the only person that can put any kind of challenge up front to this guy because the other two guys they don't know enough about anything except how to be an entertainer to even ask him the right questions because again you're 37 you just started voting two years ago so now at 37 all of a sudden you've been inspired to be president of the united states and you don't have any kind of political background right so you're going to be the youngest president in the history of the united states and really what he's trying to do is he's trying to tap into the millennial audience that is starting to approach being 40 years old. So he's an older millennial at 37. He's trying to attack, attach that audience because what do we know about that audience? There's going to be one, a great wealth transfer into that audience. And they're going to start to become what we call institutionalized to where they now have worked so long, they have invested so much into the system. They, um, they want to actually be invested in the system, Right. And so that's what you got to understand. So to me, this is how he's trying to position himself as being a, a face in this space. We got to ask ourselves, what's, what is motivated behind that? Okay, let's keep going to the video. Or how many years you sat around and did not get involved at all in any civic engagement? Is that my understanding? A long time is the answer. And actually, I wrote, I mean, that's what I wrote this book about. I am, I'm not holding myself out as some sort of model. I'm actually offering myself as a self-reflection of my journey as a okay. citizen to whom this country has yeah. given much, right? As an adult, when you have kids, it changes your perspectives. I'm very honest right. about that. Absolutely. Okay, no problem. So let's go deeper into the self-reflection. So you've sat around for, and, and sir, I'm being as respectful as I possibly can. Please don't take anything uh, and you don't even have to I just, be. And you don't yeah. even have to be. So take it yeah. off and let's well, go. So you've been sitting around in the country that my ancestors built for 
about 20 years, uh, your parents came over as immigrants, brought you over, you made millions according to your uh, resume off of this country and you have absolutely not been involved in civics, one, not voting, and two, let me just ask because I know you mentioned earlier, you don't wanna sit around at the debate and talk about accomplishments. Let's make the accomplishments pretty simple. In high school, were you ever a class president or take any leadership role? Cause your opponent did, Chris Christie, he was the class president. So yeah, have you ever I taken mean, any I, leadership at all on anything have, or just- can, can I just correct a couple factual things uh, sure, that are uh -huh. kind of important? My parents didn't bring me over to the country. I was okay, born in this country, and I'm proud no, of that. No, I know you were born here in Ohio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ohio. You, know, you mentioned my parents. I'm saying your parents were immigrants. Well, you my apologies. Yeah, that's all right. You said your parents brought you over to this country. I yeah, thought my I apologies. Set that record straight. I mean, they were immigrants, but let's they not go down immigrants. the water. Oh, no, 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 we're not going to water. I just want to correct a couple facts, and then the other thing so is you were born here in Ohio. I was correct? born. In, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. That's right. Right. So yeah. you've been here your entire life. So the question that's is, right. did you take any leadership role in middle school, high school, class president? I did. I know you played tennis. What? What is it? Explain it. Student council. But you know, I think that this is. The yes, I have I've held leadership roles over my life, but those don't qualify me to do what I'm doing now. No, That's it kind of does. Okay, well, well, it kind of does. Well, let me. Well, I'm giving the test. I'm the test okay, administrator. All right, there you go. So it kind of does because when you go from saying I want to go to the highest office, and I'll tell you, I've led companies as well. Is the other leader right, the well, main leadership right, but, role I played is is and, and I want to I want to talk about one early part of your premise that I also want to say mm -hmm. bring it to the country point. The other point you use the word sitting around. You know, I, I'm not somebody who say it. I've, I I want the next generation, my kids' generation, to have more civic duties when they graduate from high school and college than I did when I did. That being said. I wasn't sitting around. I've developed medicines, five of which are FDA approved products today. One of mm -hmm. which is a life-saving therapy in kids, 20 of whom die by the age of three if they're not treated, 70% of whom now live lives of a normal duration. Another one for prostate cancer. So I, right. I don't apologize well, for making me, contributions. But, right, well, I don't want you to filibuster that no um, because that's not, not the question there. that I ask. And I don't consider as a veteran, I'm talking about service. I'm not talking about what you Civic did for service, profit. Yeah. I'm not talking about what you what you paid people to do with yeah. your company. So I'm not, not talking served, about that. Not served the country because that means nothing to me. Do, you do what I'm talking about, she has been able to ask a question. She's been trying Go to ask a question yeah. and she, you've been talking over I'm all ears. We, we gave you the platform to let you see yeah, I'm all ears. Yeah, I'm yeah, all ears. No, I was just correcting a couple facts. That's all. Every time she tries to ask a question, you've been cutting her off. I'm all ears. So your question, so my question again is, you're trying to, your your goal is to raise the standard and you're saying you want people to believe in country and you want people to have civic engagement. And sir, I just find it very telling that you haven't had any civic engagement at all and haven't been in all. And when I say sit around, I don't mean you haven't done anything. I'm talking about in regards to service. Because one thing about political office, the same way that you want to change how people look at uh, politics and look at this country, I want to change how people look at politicians. And when I see that someone hasn't did anything at all to be of service to mankind, to take a leadership role, it's not good enough to just be on city, city uh, student council. Were you a leader? All of that applies. Have you been able to get anybody in the room at any time from the high school gymnasium to Ohio uh, Republican leadership there to now? Have you been able to get anybody in the room to believe in this vision? I don't agree with a lot of your vision statement, but I do know you've been going around having these discussions and getting everybody emotionally worked up to talk about vision and debate. But I want to get to the practical. You're trying to go from preschool to, to president of the United States. You're skipping over city council, county council, mayor, governor. You want to go straight to the top. So my question, is this a PR? Is this the PR, the perception of reality? Or have you, can you point to any leadership where you've been able to get people to believe in what you're talking about that they're not paid to do on any of these vision statements that you have? If not, then to me, it's just, it's a mute point because you're, you're telling, you're holding a standard that you haven't met yourself. So if you're only going to count government service, you're absolutely right. No, not right. government service. Okay. Student council in the eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth, were you yeah. a leader? Did you did you do anything to rally anybody? Did you fight for better lunch? I did in the sixth grade with Miss Harris. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking about government. I can go all the way back from the fifth grade every, every year, sir, because people who are in service to this country, mm -hmm. if you're going to go around saying you want people to believe in this country that I signed up to mm -hmm. die for, then I want to make sure that you're holding that same standard. So not government, not political. Let's not get it confused. Yeah. I'm saying, have you did anything of service that we can point to to say he is a good leader? Like Chris, and I'm not even a fan of Chris Christie, yeah. but he was the student council president in high school. So have you done any Thing of service besides yourself that has not benefited yourself it's just a simple question so i the acts of service that i have performed are small so small that i don't even want to talk about them to boast but yes have i volunteered A lot of Republican presidential hopefuls are happy with today's decision, including Vivek Ramaswamy, who joins us now in studio. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's good to see you. All right. So I want to start out with uh, something you posted on Twitter, uh, saying affirmative action is the single greatest form of institutional racism in America today. Why do you feel that way? I think by definition, there are institutions that regularly take race into account as a factor on whether or not someone gets a job or whether or not someone gets a seat in college. By definition, that's institutionalized racism. And I think the Supreme Court made the right decision today to vote on the side of meritocracy over race-based preferences. I think that's a step forward, it's not a destination. As the next US president, if I'm elected, I would eliminate race-based affirmative action in every other sphere of American life as well, including in the economy where it runs rampant today. So I wanna just throw some numbers out there, right? The University of California system banned- Okay, so you hear his last statement. Now, the reporter that he's interviewing with is running a program. 
So she can't really veer off the program that she's been given by the producer and the director. But when he made that statement for people that are actually politically astute, that understand the, the, the actual decision by the Supreme Court, my follow up question would have been, right, since you said that, right, that you would eliminate it in all areas of American life. Right. Why not ask him what he seek to get rid of affirmative action policy and military academies? Because if you actually read the particular, uh, I don't know what you want to call it from a legal standpoint, but if you read the document, it's about 257 pages that came out of the Supreme Court. They exempt the military academy when it comes to affirmative action. And so here's an article, right? And we're not going to be able to see it, but it says that in a blockbuster decision that essentially ended the use of race in college admissions, Chief Justice John Roberts gave U.S. military academies a carve out, uh, Simply put, West Point can keep using affirmative action, but Harvard cannot. And no military academy is a party to these cases, however, and none of the courts below address the propriety of race-based admission systems in that context. Robert wrote in the note at the bottom of page 30 of 237. So to me, that would have been a good follow-up question. But we're in an environment to where we, again, if you speak very loud, you speak very confidently, and you sound like you know what you're talking about, Nobody questions you. And when you go on these particular type of platforms, they're running a program. So they don't have the ability to veer off their program. So it doesn't matter what you say. They just have to stick to their program because they've already decided we got to ask you these particular questions because this is already what the producers have fed to that particular person. You can't do really anything spontaneous or, you know, kind of like at the moment. Let's keep going. And the use of race in admissions in 1996. In 1996, 7% of the students there were black. Today, that number is, is 2%. If you. It was not that environment. Americans have, in a shrinking economy, we should not cut entitlements. Can I ask you about another issue? This is also something that your opponents, Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, have called for, including DeSantis very recently, which is an end to birthright citizenship. What's your position on that? Would you end birthright citizenship? I think for a period of time, I think it's going to be necessary in this country because we have an influx of migrants across that southern border, 14,000 plus per day by some estimates crossing that southern border. That is not the rule of law. That is the abandonment of the rule of law. So if migrants are coming illegally, intentionally to be able to establish an illegal toehold in the United States, then I think that that's something that we should not abide in this country. And we should the say country, that I you were that one step and, uh, even I, I, we should say also, I mean, you were you're both of your parents are immigrants to the United States, so you would have been a beneficiary of birthright citizenship, but you now are saying you would ban that for people coming into the country. And what is the period of time for which that would be the case? For people coming into the country illegally. That's the key distinction. And pe people make this mistake all the time. And I think you got to be really careful when you talk about the difference between legal immigrants and illegal immigrants. One is founded on following the rule of law. The other is founded on breaking the rule of law. That might be be the case, but it does not make that distinction between yeah. whether that person was born to someone legally or not. So you are saying that even though birthright citizenship for you was something that was in play, you would take it off the table now. And my question is also, how long would that be the case? And also, how would you do it? Would you go to Congress for a constitutional amendment? Well, actually, I've supported the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. I'll actually go one step further on this, Abby, is that I don't think someone just because they're born in this country, even if they're a sixth generation American, should automatically enjoy all the privileges of citizenship until they've actually earned it. So one of the things I've said is that every high school student who graduates from high school should have to pass the same civics test that every immigrant has. OK, so we see again is that he just goes right back to the narrative. And we're going to kind of talk about why he has that ability to do that at such an elite level. So you see that it doesn't matter what he says and what somebody else says. He just rolls back to his talking points. Right. Um, and again, we talked about before he talked about he supports the 20th Amendment. I don't understand what that had to do with the context of the conversation. But for some reason, he had to throw that in there. I didn't know there was 28 amendments in the Constitution, but I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I could be incorrect. OK, so that's the video. Right. So these are, in my opinion, the way the media is handling him. And the last video at the end was the first person that kind of questioned some of the inconsistencies in what he says in his real life. And we're going to kind of go more into that. Right. So let me go ahead and start getting these uh, these slides up, because I think that what he's presenting to us sounds good to the right people. But his life doesn't really represent that. Right. And so that's why I said that this guy is an actor playing a political candidate. Right. 
because he had no political aspirations a year ago. He didn't serve on any local politics yet. And so at 37, now you want to be president of the United States. Uh, that's not really believable. But like I said, you're dealing with a large amount of population of people that don't read. They just react to stuff. Um, if you, as long as you tell them what they want to hear, they're all for it. He understands that because this is not a stupid person. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so we talk about, again, the prophet and a lot of you. So I'm going to repeat my point that I made at the beginning. Right? Vivek is creating a narrative on instructions from Peter Thiel, who desires to reshape the political conversation on the right. Vivek is an actor playing a political candidate in a world where it's easy to speak confidently and loudly, and people will think you're correct. And what's very interesting is nobody will look to figure out, you know, where this guy actually comes from. And we're not doing this to embarrass him, but we're doing this to get an understanding of whether or not he's believable. And also, let me say this real quickly. We have to learn when we're dealing with political candidates is that what we desire is not up for negotiation. So when you have real political advocacy, politicians don't come to you to debate anything. When you have real political advocacy, politicians don't come to you to have a discussion. You give politicians what your terms are and either they can meet your terms or they can't. So to ask on your vote is your terms, right? Then they got to put their bid in on what they're going to do for your vote. We have to get out of this, and this is just my opinion, this narrative that I'm being valued by a candidate because he wants to hear me out. There's nothing to hear out. You can go speak to my political advocacy or my political representative and they'll tell you what we want and I go do what I do. So he's not doing me a favor by going to the breakfast club. He's not doing me a favor by going to a barbershop in Chicago because that's not how power works. A political candidate, right, doesn't come to me to debate or have a discussion. My terms are not up for discussion. Either going to give me my terms or you not. But we're not going to talk for four hours around my terms. And so I think we need to kind of reshape how we see politics but because we're not used to having any kind of political advocacy. We don't know what that looks like. We entertain these games. And what the Republican Party has done is they've turned the Anglo working class voter into just as politically apathetic and politically uninformed and unsophisticated as we are. So they got this thing working on both sides now. The Democratic Party has the has the black vote being very unsophisticated, don't know what political advocacy is. The Republican Party has the working class and poor white vote being unsophisticated and don't know what political advocacy is. So now they just play entertainment games and nothing ever, nothing gets done. Right? Because people still don't know what political advocacy looks like. They just talk. And you ask them, and I've done this on YouTube, what do you want from your politician? And them that question like what do you want i don't know what i want so then if you don't know what you want then you can't get it so you're the kind of person that goes to a car lot you let them put you in a car i'm the kind of person that go to a car lot, i already know what kind of car i want to buy and i know how much i'm gonna pay for it and either we're gonna make a deal around those terms or we don't have no deal don't nobody put me in a car i don't play them type of games so we're just different type of people right so they're able to take advantage of that the majority of people of the world outside of you know basic creature comforts sex drugs entertainment really don't know what they want so they just feed you more entertainment more sex more drugs more creature comforts and you're happy and you let them run the world let's get back to it right so let's talk about a little bit about what's going on so here's an article from fox business right republican mega donor peter thiel will not fund any 2024 candidates sources told reuters thiel who previously supported donald trump presidential bill has told associates He's not going to donate to any candidates in 2024. Peter Thiel is unhappy with the Republican Party's focus on hot button U.S. cultural issues, including abortion, right? Bathroom restrictions for transgender students. The sources said Thiel came to his conclusion later this year. One associate also said Thiel believes Republicans are making a mistake by concentrating on cultural points and it should be bolstering U.S. innovation in competition with the Chinese. Now, I've said this earlier to me. It's very interesting that so many conservative men are what I call trans attracted. 
if you go on social media, a lot of people that's quote unquote on the conservative side that are males, their whole timeline is full of like what trans people are doing. It's very weird to me. It's not weird to me because they're trans people. It's weird to me to where you're a heterosexual person, but you're interested in trans people. Now, if that's what you're interested in, that's what you're interested in. I'm not judging nobody. It's 2023. Live your life. But it just is interesting to me that so many people on the right, especially males that present themselves as heterosexuals, are so trans attracted to where you can get their attention talking about what trans people are doing. That don't get my attention because I don't care what they're doing because I'm not interested in that. Right. And so a person like Peter Thiel, to me, is looking at where this conversation is going. And he says, well, you know what? I'm not going to support any candidates because Peter Thiel is a gay man. He's married to a man. I don't think he likes the tone of the Republican Party right now because, see, Trump wasn't on any of that because Trump's from New York City. He's done business with all kinds of different type of people. So Trump really, really on this anti-trans, anti-gay, calling everybody a groomer. He really wasn't on that tilt. But now that it's a new kind of like the Republican Party has kind of gone back to being what the Republican Party is, they've decided to polarize around these particular issues, right? And for some reason, that's just what the decision that they made. So that's all that they're talking about pretty much over the past six months. The Bud Light issue, the Target issue, they didn't like Pride Month. Like it's just real weird that they made this what they're going to talk about. And so Peter Thiel being a gay man, has decided that he don't want to be on that train because he know that train doesn't work for him. So he's not supporting any candidates. In my opinion, what he's trying to do with J.D. Vance, with Vivek, he's trying to, trying to change the narrative because what do we know now? That on the right, we have these verticals that are media-based, created by really, really wealthy people, Daily Wire being one, Turning Point USA being another. Well, you can go look up, see who their donors are. Right. Prager University being another one. You can go look up, see who Prager University, who donated, who really created that business model. It wasn't created by Prager. It's created by a really bunch of rich business people. And then they put Prager in position. Right. They just called it Prager University. They probably own the name Prager University. Prager probably only owned that name. And now they create media because they're trying to shape the narrative. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. That's what I said Kanye should do instead of you doing all the talking. You should pay somebody to talk for you. And you sit back and you let that person take all the heat and you out of the way. But that's what they're doing. So to me, Vivek is another representation of that. Right. Let's keep going. Now, this is what I want you to understand about Vivek. Vivek is a Brahmin. And now we're going to get into why I don't believe a lot of what he's saying. He's a Brahmin. Now, if you understand Hindu culture. You understand that Hinduism is based on the caste system. And I'm not an expert on that particular culture, but I'm going to give it to you based on my understanding of it. You're born into a particular caste and you're fixed in that caste. There is no real economic upward mobility or social mobility. Now, have some people at a lower caste done very important things in Indian society? Definitely. But when you're looking at Brahmins, they're around 4% of Indian society. They're around 4%, but they're the top caste. So he is a top caste person. He comes out of a top caste family, right? So when this guy, we're going to kind of talk about this throughout this conversation, you're going to hear him, if you listen to him speak, say he believes in meritocracy. He believes he's against affirmative action because he believes America should be based on meritocracy. That's unusual to me because you are a member of a religion where there is no meritocracy. You're born into a particular caste. Your jobs and your duties are really supposed to be based on that caste also. You can't get out of that caste. You're often not allowed to marry out of that caste. And that's how they govern their society. So what's interesting to me is that there is no meritocracy in your faith. You're born into a position. You're stuck there until the day you die. But now you believe that everybody in America should operate in a meritocracy, but in your own faith, there is no meritocracy. It's not like my faith to where your seals can be, your sins can be washed away if you just accept the Lord, right? Or you say, hey, I'm living by grace, right? So you, you're a sinner, but you're living by grace. You don't have that concept in his religion. You're born into a particular situation. And what you got to understand is that I know that India can't be a, to me, a great place to live. 
when, when you have people born at the top of Indian society and a very small amount of people and they get the benefit of being on top and they still leave India. It got to be a lot going on in India for them not want to stay there because everything in India is set up for them to be successful. Now, who else is a Brahmin? The guy that's the CEO of Google, he's a Brahmin. The top guy, Microsoft, he's also a Brahmin. So what you're seeing in American society is that a lot of Brahmins are coming into American society. And they're operating at a very, very high level because that's already what they were doing where they're from. They just don't want to do that where they're from. But I don't believe for a second that this guy believes in a meritocracy for all people because his own religion doesn't practice a meritocracy. So he still is an active Hindu, but he's telling me he believes in meritocracy. Well, that's a violation of your own religion. So these are the kind of questions people need to ask him. Why would you speak about meritocracy and everybody just living off their merit? But in your own religion, you can't. If I'm born as a sudra, I can't marry myself up into being a Brahmin. It doesn't work that way in this system. I'm stuck being a sudra until the day I die. Let's go to the next one. So I want people to understand that. Now, here's the high school he went to. Now, he'll talk about the fact that he went to with he went to public schools from zero to eighth grade. And he'll speak about that and talk about how he went to school with black people, yada, yada, yada. But he went to high school, a place called St. Xavier, right, in the Natty, also known as Cincinnati. Now, St. Xavier is a Catholic school. Here's their mission, to assist young men in the formation of leaders and men for others through rigorous college preparation and Jesuit tradition. We believe that rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the spiritual exercises of St. I think that's Ignatius, Ignatius, the school is an apostolic mission by naming Jesus Christ as the model for all human life, Affirming the word is God's creation and therefore good, but in need of redemption. Last one, providing students with comprehensive instruction in Catholic beliefs and practices, providing students with opportunities for spiritual formation in the Catholic faith through participation in sacraments, prayer, retreat service, and other spiritual programs. Now, he, fit four, he spent four years at this particular high school. But what happened, though? It didn't turn him into a Catholic. So this guy's a committed Hindu. There's nothing wrong with that. He was born into that particular faith. His whole family's that faith. But even though he went to a four-year Catholic private school, which I know he had to pray, I know he had to go to church, right? As part of being in that particular school, he didn't come out a Catholic. He stayed a Hindu. So he's a committed Hindu. And there's nothing wrong with that, Right? So my question is, how come your beliefs don't align with your faith and your religion? How come you trying to tell me that you got a different set of beliefs? Because your faith and your religion don't practice mediocrity. It doesn't do that. It doesn't practice meritocracy. That's not what your faith does. Your faith doesn't say that, you know what? If you just renounce your sins, you can go from being a soldier to a Brahmin. It don't say that. Right? It says you're stuck here and through, I guess, karma or reincarnation, you got to hope you come back out of higher caste. Okay, let's go to the next one. He talks about meritocracy being the law of the land, and that's what he believes in. So he was awarded a scholarship from the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. Now, a lot of people on the right are going to come after him because he took money from the Soros. I don't care about that. What I want you to understand is that he got a scholarship because he was an anchor baby. Without him being an anchor baby, he doesn't get the scholarship. Now, do you need the grades? Yes, but he got the scholarship because he was an anchor baby. There's no meritocracy there. Right? So just by the fact that he was born to immigrant parents, he was able to get the scholarship, not just based on his grades. So if you had the grades, but you weren't born to immigrant parents, you're not eligible for the scholarship. I want to create a scholarship for Georgian natives who have ancestors that were impacted by chattel slavery. That's going to be the first criteria. You got to be a Georgian native, which means you got to be born in the state of Georgia. And you got to have ancestors that were impacted by chattel slavery. Because one thing I see about this particular part of the state, Metro Atlanta, is all the Georgian natives being pushed out. And we being brought in by a bunch of people. They're not even from the South. And they're in this city. And I don't like that. So I don't care if I got $1,000 a year for you. I'm going to try to do something for you to get you on your feet because Georgia natives need somebody looking out for them. 
So there's no meritocracy because you got to be a Georgia native first and then second, your people got to be impacted by chattel slavery. With this particular scholarship, it's not based on just his grades. It's based on the fact that he was an anchor baby. Right. And that's what I want people to understand. You have to really realize that what he's saying he's about is not really what he's about. And nobody will question him on wall of a sudden. Now you came to this real, this realization that everything should be just based on merit. OK. Also, Paul and Daisy Sowers Fellowship for New Americans program is intended for immigrants and children of immigrants in the United States to be eligible. Your birth parents must have been born outside of the U.S. as non-U.S. citizens and both parents must not have been eligible for U.S. citizenship at the time of their births, right? Now we go into the academic standards and now we go into the age. Age is also not married because it's a form of ageism because you got to be under 30. So that's also not married because what if you're 40 but you got great grades when well, you can't get that scholarship? Now, Paul and his Soros and his wife, they have a right to do whatever they want to do with their money. It's private money. But that's not based on his merit. It's based on the fact that he was an anchor baby. That's why he was able to get this scholarship from the Soros. So this is what you want to ask these people question. When did all of a sudden you become about merit? Because I can tell you when I changed my life, when I say, you know what, I'm not going to do what I used to do. It's not a mystery. I can tell you it was a point in my life where I say, you know what, I don't do this anymore. There was a point in my life where I could say, you know what, I don't do this anymore. But I'm not going to espouse that I believe certain ideas to you. And I can't explain the stuff I was involved in in the past. Right. I can explain why I was doing certain stuff because that's what I was involved in. But I'm not going to try to sit and act like I never did this stuff. Right. And I'm going to hold everybody else to a standard that I'm not going to hold myself to. Like I told you before, if you want to smoke weed, smoke out. Why? Because I used to smoke. So I can't judge you for smoking weed when I used to smoke. Right. And I would tell you, hey, you're going to miss out on these opportunities. This may not come to you. Yada, yada, yada. But I'm not going to look down on you for doing the exact same thing I used to do. So I don't really respect that to where you're saying that everything should be about merit, but you were able to get certain benefits from certain people just based on your circumstances of birth, not just based on your merit. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Now, Paul and Davey Soros, so he's listed on the website. Vivek Ramsaswamy, 2011, right? Founder of Rovivian uh, Sciences. Vivek is a child of immigrants from India, right? So fellowship and water support work towards a JD and law at Yale University. Okay. Then what you also want to understand is that if we roll down, he and another Brahmin Soros fellowship member, they also worked at that tech uh, startup that he worked at, not tech startup, a biotech startup. So they got a click of Brahmin, right? Uh, fellows from Paul and Daisy Soros. Right. So you got to really understand that they clicking up, they linking up while everybody else talking about it, they can't work with each other. Now, why do you think he's always telling people, let's debate, let's debate, let's debate, let's debate, let's debate, let's debate. Why do you think he's telling people that? Because the guy was a, he's a debater. So here's an article from the Crimson.com It's dated 2006, which is a long time ago now. Right. Some people that's watching my channel might have been six years old then, but that's a long time ago. OK. If you think debater extraordinaire Vivek G. Ramaswamy 07 is intense, you haven't met Devek, which I guess was like his nickname. Though Devek raps libertarian prose with the utmost of ease, don't expect to see him in section. The rapper who fairly showed off his skills at the Bust Around concert in spring 2004 only emerges with Ramaswamy's entire outfitted entirely in black complete with a black Kango hat. They're two completely different people, right? When the vet goes into hiding the chairman, the nickname co coined for Ramaswamy during his tenure at Harvard Political Union comes out to play. I consider myself a contrarian. Ramaswamy affirms, I like to argue. The Kirkland House biology concentrator has quenched his thirst for debate through his involvement with the Institute of Politics and debating for the Harvard Republican Club. Ramaswamy, who was raised in a traditional Hindu family but attended Catholic high school, describes Harvard as an ideal playground for intellectual sport, right? So he comes out of a debate background, which is why he always tries to go back to 
let's debate, 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 debate. And so this is why I say this guy's an actor. The way you hear him talk, the way he projects his voice, I guarantee he don't talk like that at home with his wife and children. He's learned how to project his voice almost like an actor on stage. It's a performance, right? But there's not really anything behind it. And one thing you learn about debate, if you've ever taken debate, is they teach you to argue positions that are not even yours. So one thing you learn in debate is you learn how to argue your position, then you learn how to argue the position of the people that are opposed to you. They have something called impromptu debate where they just give you a position and you have to argue it. And so you learn how to be very skilled at arguing positions that necessarily um, aren't yours because this is sometimes what you have to do in politics. They may just say, hey, we need you to stump for this particular issue. And when you listen to him talk, everything sounds like a stump speech. He's always stumping for something, right? And that's what I want you to understand. This guy comes out of a debate background. He was an experienced debater. He was very uh, enthusiastic about debating. So this is why he always tries to bring things back to the debate model. This is why he says, well, let me come on your show. We can have a debate. Let me explain something to you. My political advocate is not going to debate with you about what we want. There will be no debate. Either you're going to give us what we want or you're not going to give us what we want. We're not going to argue with you because we're not entertainers. I don't run a media platform. I run a game platform. We will not entertain you. Right? So I know why so many people like them because we got so many people on YouTube that like to do the eight-hour live streams and everybody just yells and screams at each other at a very loud voice. So they love this type of stuff. This is their new form of entertainment. Right? This guy is a debater. He's really low-key, almost a professional debater. And as a person that's trained in debate, he doesn't have to actually believe in the position that he's talking about. He's been trained to take any position and to be very passionate and very and very enthusiastic about defending that position if he don't believe in it. So that's why he can talk to you about meritocracy and America need to be based around meritocracy. And he's a member of a particular faith where there is no meritocracy. And he believes in that. Even after four years of Catholic school, he came right out of Hindu. So nothing changed because I guarantee you his parents made sure he kept going to temple every weekend. Let's go to the next one. Now, here's his Vimeo page, right? Here's his Vimeo page. Now, let me go to his Vimeo page in another section. Let me show you this real quick. Because, like I said before, this guy is very much academically accomplished. He's a very smart guy. There's nothing dumb about this guy. So what you're not going to hear me do is call the guy dumb. Right? Won't happen. Now, here is his Strive Media Real. The goal is to restore the voice of the everyday citizen in corporate America where they He's haven't been heard. Of because one Strive. of the problems in this country, Steve, is that the three largest asset managers in the world, that's BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, these three firms basically control nearly every public company in corporate America in now, an you indirect this was a year way. Ago. I think they're using their clients' capital this five to years advocate ago. for viewpoints in the boardrooms of corporate America that most of their own clients disagree in politics, with. Nationalism, and politics, here's the problem, baby. Glenn. Just think about this as a, as a second for a thought experiment, all right? If you had the CEOs of Exxon and Shell and Chevron get together in a room and say, we're going to cut gas production, and then gas prices spike at the pump as a result, mm -hmm. this would be the stuff of movies. People would be walking out, perp walks in handcuffs. Okay, it's yep. antitrust violation. Yet today, when the largest owners of those firms effectively direct them and mandate them to do the same okay. thing, somehow that gets so celebrated as ESG instead. The argument drive that media. But let me show you something else. See, so he got a cold little Vimeo page. See, we do research over here. That's why we're so good in the markets. Valedictorian. I've been racing my entire high school See, so like I said, this is not a dumb person. But now when we're finally crossing the finish line, I wish I could have stopped just a little earlier and caught a breath of the fresh air that had surrounded me the whole time. Teachers. Staff, classmates, counselors, and friends, I'd like to welcome you to the 2003 St. X graduation ceremony. You understand me? So even as a 17, 18 year old person, he still talk like that. That's just how he projects. And somebody like GC that knows the, the finance space and knows the IPO space, a lot of these founders are trained to talk a certain way to get people to have confidence in you so they can do what so they can give you some money. 
even that Anglo woman that went to prison for like 11 years, I forgot the name of that particular, so Ther Theranos, or Ther Theranos, the little uh, blood company that she was trying to present out there. She spoke in a very deep voice because she understood in these spaces that are primarily male, I want men to have confidence in me. So she spoke in this artificial deep voice. I wasn't even her real voice, but she understood how to put on this voice. She dressed like Steve Jobs. She did whatever she needed to do to get people to have confidence in her vision and to make sure they gave her money. Right. That's where a lot of this comes from, because when you're road showing. And you're trying to get people to give you millions of dollars to invest in your company, you have to be able to put confidence in those people. So what you really try to do is you try to literally overdo it because it's a lot of it is psychological. And we know that fake it till you make it works. Most people, if you act like you know something and you act like you believe in yourself and you act like you're confident, they won't ever question you because they're not confident. And you'd be surprised how many people that got a lot of money are really not confident. They just got a lot of money. And they'll give you your money because you're confident. So that's what I want you to really understand. People that come out of these spaces, people like me that's in these markets, people like GC that's in these IPO tech spaces, we know what we're looking at. Right? We know what we're looking at. Like I said before, this is not a dumb person. So he was able to look at the space and say, see all these dumb people in the right wing space and they're getting all this traction. Oh, I know I could go over here and get something going because these people are nowhere near as smart as me. They can't speak as well as me and they have not been prepared as well as me. And they don't have the kind of networks he has. This guy knows Peter Thiel and we're going to kind of show you what I mean by that. So that's his Vimeo page. You can go check it out. He got a call on the Vimeo page, but he's been doing media for a while. But the media platforms he's on, I don't watch. And also, I don't watch television like that. So I wouldn't see him anyway. Let's keep going with it. Like I said, the reason why we get money out of these markets, man, we do research. So here's Stride. That's the company that he did the bumper reel for, right? So Peter Thiel's new venture aims to lure companies away from environmental justice activism, right? So the trend of woke corporate governance is so persuasive and divisiveness. Its effects on the bottom line are so hard to ignore that two ambitious entrepreneurs, Vivek Ramaswamy and Anson Freerichs, that's you pronounce his name, co-founded a new investment firm, Strive Asset Management in May. Backed by venture capitalists Peter Thiel and Bill Ackman, founder and CEO of Purging Square Capital, Strive's role is to foster and support cooperations operating free from ESG and DNI imperatives and in accordance with more traditional criteria, or as a firm's financial website reads, our mission is to restore the voices of everyday citizens in the American economy by leading companies to focus on excellence over politics. If you look at some of Strive's holdings, right, this is their Strive U.S. Energy ETF. If you look at what's in there, 21% is ExxonMobil, 15% is Chevron, 7% is Conco Phillips, then it goes on down. But they're pretty much all oil companies. Their tech company, their largest holding is NVIDIA. So I know that particular platform made a lot of money. My bad, I should have shared the screen. Let me get this over here. My bad on that. I should have shared the screen. So what you want to understand is that he's been put up by Peter Thiel to do what he's doing. Okay. So here's the article, Peter Thiel, New Venture aims to lure companies away from environmental justice activism, and here's Strive, right? 21% ExxonMobil, 15% Chevron, 7% ConocoPhillips. There's not anything exotic in this ETF. And so what they did was they built a fund based on telling uh, investors, we're going to go after companies that are not pushing ESG and DNI. That's going to be their value proposition. That's their differentiation. And so that's what he was doing as a commentator. And so this is to me where this all this anti-woke stuff came from, because he's trying to raise money in his fund, right, based on taking this particular position, right? Because there's only so many companies that you can invest in in S&P 500, right? There's only so many companies. So if all you're going to do is basket the companies that already exist, you're not really basking startups. You're not in basking, you know, pre-stage or early stage IPOs. You're just going to bask in the companies that already exist. What you have to do is create a narrative around why you're doing that. Right. And so that's why I tell us, man, we got to learn these markets, because if we can, I don't know what the licensing is to create an ETF, but I can create an ETF and just fill it full of oil companies and say, hey, man, we're taking this particular narrative. And so that's why we're investing in yada, yada, yada. And nobody's going to really go look and realize what well, David just invested. He just essentially put a basket together of all the oil companies. 
Just what, how, how long you think it took you to do that? Then if you go to the tech one, let me go to the tech one real quick. He just put a basket together, the semiconductor ETF, right? NVIDIA 10%, Broadcom, AMD, Texas Instruments, Qualcomm, Marvell Technology, Lamb Research. Like, how difficult was it to put that? Because the majority of the ETF is Broadcom and NVIDIA. So I know the fund is up now because of NVIDIA, but there's nothing exotic here, right? There's nothing exotic here. So that's what I want you to understand is that this is just really about promoting him, promoting Strive at one time. He's essentially a, to me, a protege of Peter Thiel. And now Peter Thiel has decided to go in this particular direction and we're going to use Vivek as the face of that, right? Let's go into the next article. Make sure it's coming up. Okay, it's up. All right. So Strive Asset Management Chairman Vivek Ramaswamy just resigns to run for president. So this is February 22nd, 2023. Strive Asset Manager co-founder Vivek is taking his anti-woke message to the next level by campaigning to be nominated as a Republican candidate for president of the United States 2024. Made his official announcement Tuesday evening on Fox News while I'm running for president. He resigned from the chairman of Strive, a $650 million asset management firm. Now, let me explain something to you. $650 million is a lot of money. It's way more money I've ever made in my life, right? I can make a lot of money and not make $650 million, and I'd be, one, I'd be very happy. But in the fund space, $650 million is a very small firm, right? It's a very, very small firm in the fund space because there's people that can hand you. There's people in this country that can just hand you $50 million, right? They, like they, they really have that kind of money. They can just give you 50 million. They can give you 20 million. It's not a big deal to them. So he's operating a relatively small fund, but he's trying to differentiate it as being anti-woke, right? But let me explain something to you. Companies have always involved themselves in politics. That's not anything new, right? Companies have always involved themselves in politics. DeSantis took money from Disney, Right? Disney's going to still uh, donate to the Republican Party of the state of Florida. That's why they're playing themselves with what they're doing, because Disney's not going anywhere. They're going to be here when me and DeSantis are gone. Disney's still going to be there. OK, so this narrative that all of these corporations are playing politics and they need to get out of politics. Corporations have always been involved in politics because billion dollar CEOs control politicians. So when have corporations never been involved in politics? Right? Major corporations, because of their financial ability, can get deals from government that I can't get because they donate to politicians at such a level, they're able to bring back deals. So when have corporations never been involved in politics? But like I said, for you to look at his book differently than everybody else, he has to present it as anti-woke. Now, let's get a little bit deeper because I want you to understand something. Peter Thiel is worth around $4 billion, okay? Peter Thiel is worth around $4 billion. Vivek, from my research, is worth around $15 to $20 million. That's a lot of money to me. To me, you can become a double-digit millionaire, you did it, right? You did it. If you become a double-digit millionaire in America, you good. You don't really got to work again. You just got to learn how to manage your money. However, one of the easiest ways in this world to become rich is to work for rich people. Not work a job, not like, say, go work for Home Depot. No, one of the easiest ways to become rich in this world is to go work for a rich person. So if you're worth $100,000 and you go work for somebody worth $10 million, they can help make you a millionaire. Because why? They network as millionaires. If you're a double-digit millionaire and you want to get known for that $100 million mark, you know what you go do? You go work for a billionaire. And so to me, Vivek has decided, I'm going to work for Peter Thiel. I'm going to serve this man in a way in which he wants to be served because what? He can take me from 15 million to 100 million. Because even though that IPO was, you know, everybody wants to talk about he did drugs and yada, yada, yada. Most people that are talking about this guy was working with a, in the biotech space, they can't even name you the drugs that are on the market. They don't, they don't look at companies like that. That's what we do over here. They don't do that. Because they're going to be talking about something next week. 
Because earlier this week, they was talking about something else. Last week, they was talking about Umar Johnson. So they got to just create a new story every week. So they're going to just touch the story real light. What we do over here is we really get deep into it so we can understand how to look at these things from a very pragmatic point of view. Right? So in my opinion, he's been recruited by Peter Thiel to craft a certain narrative because he he can play the, I'm the child of immigrants. I went to Harvard. I went to Yale. And I just, you know, was an excellent student. And so I believe that the American dream can work for everybody. Now, we will never find out whether or not he got into Harvard because of affirmative action, because we're just supposed to assume he got into Harvard off his grades. But that may not be true. We'll never find out whether or not he got into Yale because of affirmative action, because we just supposed to assume he got into Yale off his grades because he's Asian. But that may not be true. Right. So he's able to play this role and then he's able to confirm the belief that a lot of people have is that, you know what? Well, you know, America's a meritocracy, man. You know, America uh, uh, work better if everybody just operate off merit. And he had a woman ask him the other day about when you're talking about affirmative action. How come you don't talk about white women being the biggest recipient of affirmative action? And he acted like that was the first time he had ever heard that. Because he can't get traction in conservative spaces talking about exempting white women from affirmative action. They don't want to hear that because the white woman primarily is married to the white man. And the white man don't want the white woman to get denied of opportunity because what is that going to do? That's going to take money out of his household. Right? So his job is to, is to promote economic warfare and lack of access for black folks, not for white women. So that's why he can't talk about that. Right? So that's what I want you to understand is that there's a profit incentive to lie to you. And the Breakfast Club killed this particular guy's false narrative. Now, if you disagree with me about what I'm talking about, let me give an opportunity to come on live. Right? But what you got to talk about is the actual topic. Everything else is, you're not going to be able to talk about that. There's one thing about us, man. The reason why we're so successful is because we know how to stay focused. So if you want to come on live and if you disagree with what I talked about, here's your opportunity. Let me go ahead and pin that in there. So that's pinned in the chat. And then I'm going to read the comments, man. We're going to get up on out of here. So let me put this banner up real quick. And really quickly before we get out of here, man, the show is sponsored by www.thehighspay.online. Next week, we're going to be launching Buy Now, Pay Later uh, solutions for you. Right? We're going to be offering Buy Now, Pay Later. Also got a PDF coming out that, in my opinion, will save you thousands of dollars over the course of your life, right? And we still got the best options training academy. We still put the most time into the academy. We still are constantly working to improve the academy because the difference between me and Vivek is I couldn't get no scholarship, man, just because of uh, the situation behind my parents. I really had to go put the work in, right? Didn't nobody favor me, man, just because of where my parents came from. I really had to go to put the work in. So we built everything because of our community and because we was willing to put the work in. So yes, yeah, so you want to come on, man, Come through. Let me read these comments when we get up on out of here. And don't be shy. So I'm going to tell you, you know, all the chat warriors, when you cold in the chat, just get on the mic and be cold on the mic. Be like Vivid. Don't let this Indian dude outdo you and you from here. Don't do that. Let's keep going. So Ray Gun man, I appreciate the $2. Uh, Julian Brown, I appreciate the $5. Getty L, I appreciate the $5. Donna Watts, man, I appreciate the $19.99. Lovely, uh, lovely mind. I appreciate the $20. Oh, my bad. I ain't even reading it out. So Mark Brown says, my appreciation. Donald Watts says, Dave is undefeated out here. Lovey mind says, great analysis, Dave. I appreciate it. Mark Swift says, I work with many people born in India. They don't want to return to college in the U.S. The Anarch is a great book about India and the East Indian Corporation took over that country. Okay, I'm going to check that out. Appreciate the, uh, the heads up on that. Jared, $20, man. Appreciate the $20. Dave on point as usual. Getty L, man. Appreciate the $20. Amika, appreciate the $10. And on Uber, I appreciate the $19.99, man. Appreciate everybody coming through with the super chats. So, like I say, man, if you want to, if you disagree with me, let me put that up there. If you disagree with me, man, come on live. You know, the Umar uh, situation got live, man. Don't, you know, don't be scared to come up here. 
People making three hour videos about the Breakfast Club. I know y'all got something to say about it, and they didn't like what they said to that dude. I don't know why y'all care what they said to that dude. He don't care what they say to y'all. Let's keep going. Let me start from the top. So what's going on with Katrina? What's going on with Amika? Miss Phoenix 91, appreciate you for coming through. Alonzo, the all-star advisor, appreciate it. GC, Brandy L, Donna Watts out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. I know somebody from there. I can't remember who it is, though. Right? What's, what's up to the East Bay? Atlanta. Yeah, definitely. J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. Right? So J.D. Vance is another Peter Thiel creation. I need to do some research on Blake Masters, but I know who J.D. Vance is. So Peter Thiel has seeded the right with certain people. And he, he, he they're going to make sure they stay in there because, again, if you look at Vivek, he don't touch any gay commentary. And I'm not saying he should, but if you notice, he stay on business and he real hard on affirmative action race because he's supposed to be the example of somebody that didn't need affirmative action. If you notice, he don't say nothing about the gay situation. And I'm not saying that he should. I'm saying that he won't because Peter Thiel is trying to get the conversation away from that because he don't believe it's productive. It is what it is. Right. I tell people all the time, everybody got a boss. Right. No matter how big you think somebody is, they got somebody else they got to answer to. That's how this world works. So all these people that I don't answer to nobody, can nobody tell me what to do. That's what's stopping your growth because you ain't got nobody to answer to. Even if it's somebody in your family. So Donna Watt says, as soon as he started saying an equal opportunity for all stuff I was done, providing opportunities cost money that he didn't want to advocate for. Yeah, you're right. A lot of these libertarian dudes, their attitude is that they act like they're libertarians, but they very much are, are proponents of closing the door behind everybody else. Because if you look at Vivek, but you all look at Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel is the son of German immigrants, Right. I don't think he was even born in Saudi United States. I think he came over here and became nationalized. And what we're having is people like Peter Thiel, and he's able to recruit people like Vivek. Their family has not even invested 100 years in this country. And they're presenting themselves as knowing what's best for America. And this is something why we're talking about Latino immigrants and people coming from south of the border. We have a contingent of people whose family has not even invested 100 years into this land. They don't really have a track record here. And they are now talking as if they know what's best for the direction of America just because they have financial success. And we got to be wary of that because we got to ask ourselves, right, what are they really loyal to, right? Because many of them, again, there's stuff behind the scenes that they got going on that don't really match up to what they're talking about, right? So that's something a lot of people don't understand. Peter Thiel's a very, you know, he's a hell of a business person. Uh, but he don't really have a history in this country. He really don't. His people really don't either. Right. They really kind of just came over here. So she must she she be amused, says he worried about take civics in the eighth or twelfth grade. So misamused. From the libertarians that I've known over the course of my life, many of them are proponents the people having to take a test to be able to vote. Many of them have talked about that. They believe that you being a person being able to vote just by their age allows people to vote that really are not quote unquote uh, qualified to vote. Now you notice they don't want it to be military service. They want it to be test based. But then the question is who's making the test? Right. But, yeah, that's not a new idea that he came up with. I've heard I heard that 20 years ago from libertarians that they wanted to be a test that you got to take. But see, we already had it in the South, in the South, to where not only do you have a poll tax, they made you take a test. And if you look at the test, they have people take. They did an exercise years ago about the test that I think Mississippi was making black people take the vote. And they gave it to a bunch of Harvard students and they couldn't even pass a test. So the test wasn't even passable. But they can say, well, we, you didn't pass the test. That's why you can't vote. So you got to kind of be me. You got to put your antennas up when people are saying, well, you can get drafted at 18, but the vote, we want you to take a test. But it is what it is. 
I think people don't know enough civics, but then the question is who's teaching it? Yeah, definitely just it, executive legislative and, and judicial. Yeah, I mean, I know that, and I'm not the I'm not a civic superstar. But I know the people in the breakfast club don't know that. That audience is really not that sharp. So PhD program says Steele's been a co-author of a book, The Diversity Myth. He's been on this march for decades. Yeah, I believe you. I 100 percent believe you. Right? So Kenya from Cali says, more left-leaning than I imagine. So I'm not a left or a right, I'm a buccaneer. Um, so all that left, right, Republican, Democrat stuff, y'all can do that on your own. Uh, that doesn't make me any money. It doesn't make the people around me money. So now I'm not in any of these political parties. I'm a buccaneer. Came in the door buccaneer, I'm going to leave a buccaneer. But if I disappointed you, you know, it is what it is. But I don't do any of that stuff. They, you know, people been doing that stuff for 100 years and they ain't got $5 to rub together. That's why I don't do it. But big up to you, man. Big up to Cali. So Levante says the 20th Amendment changed elected officials. Okay, I don't understand what that means. 20th Amendment, right? I got to go verify that because I only thought it was 27th Amendment. So is there actual 20th Amendment or a proposed 20th Amendment? So what is the 20th Amendment, right? So I got to go verify that. Humble manifest of riches. But do this. Put your uh, put your super chat in the in the in the comments so I can see it on the live on the replay. So if I verify it, I'll shoot it to you because it ain't nothing to me. So opinion says Tesla did a terrible job. I guess I don't. What what do you believe her job was? If she did it so terrible, so what would you have preferred her job to be? Right. And like I said, man, you come on. If you disagree, you ain't got to just stay in the chat. So six the goddess says. Six six goddess. He's only here in America because of civil rights that blacks fought for. I don't see any as at the marches. You know, everybody knows that. You know, it, it is what it is. You know, um, I think we have done a terrible job of uh, putting a wall around the work that we've done. We've let everybody eat off the work that we've done. And most black people can't even eat off the work that we've done. Right. So we've had affirmative action, let's say since the late 60s. But even though they really didn't get rolled out into the 70s. A lot of that affirmative action policy got gutted in the 80s. Most black people never got access to affirmative action policy. They still not getting access to it. As a black man, I get the least amount of affirmative action. Right? Because I'm not in the military. And we saw how the military um, is not going to get rid of affirmative action. Because they understand that they need diversity of leadership because we have a, we have a military that just, that's disproportionately black and Latino. Right? So they understand what the future of their military needs to look like. Um... But if I'm because I'm not a military service, I get the least amount of affirmative action. So most black people have never really been able to tap into affirmative action policy. This idea that every black person is where they're at because of affirmative action really, to me, feeds into this idea that white people just default are better than black folks. So they got to be unless it's sports or entertainment. Right. But it is what it is. So James said, dude is a plant. I picked it up. He was on all the talk shows before announcing the run for president. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder who his uh his PR firm is. And that's something that Tes Tesla was asking him. Right. Is this just a PR run for you? Right. So that's something that she was asking him. So we got Michelle then came up. Is this just a PR run? Because if you notice, if you go to his his uh Vimeo page, he was on a bunch of channels right before he decided to run for president. So they was doing a lead out. They do that in entertainment all the time. They don't just put you out there. You know, Master P, you know, before he puts you out, he puts you on five different people out while some people get familiar with you. Then we drop the album. We just don't throw you out there to the woods because nobody don't know you ain't got no credibility. That's the game. Okay, so Miss, let me go and pull up. Miss Michelle came on. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you for having me on your show, Mr. Diamond Dave. I appreciate it. Um, okay. I, um, if I may, should I share my opinion on the interview? 
Yeah, so if you disagree with what I'm saying, go ahead. Uh, I, my concern with the um, interview is, especially with the Breakfast Club, I think they have, um, for lack of a better wording, an agenda. I think they could have curtailed some of the questions to fit more of what we need as a voting uh, population. Um, if you review some of the comment sections, uh, those chiefs received a lot of backlash. And uh, I, I just really felt for her because I really feel sometimes she probably was put up to it, but not really understanding what she was put into. Okay, so let me ask you a question real quick. You said they have an agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if they do have an agenda, is there something uh, negative about them having an agenda? Um, what, what I mean by negative having an agenda, there's nothing negative, but I think I'm aware of what direction they're trying to take it. And our... And our needs as black people are, are a little different from what their agenda is. If you understand okay. what I'm saying. Okay. Because she was asking about what he was doing in the fifth grade, sixth grade. I'm like, okay, what does this got to do with uh, the needs of us as a people at large? Because this is a black themed show. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Do you think the mission of the Breakfast Club is to be a political advocate for black people? Not 100%. As what, see, what percent? What percent would you say it is? Maybe 30. Okay, so you think they failed at the 30% of being a political advocate for black people? Yeah, definitely. Because even in the background, you can see certain propagandas, you know, the rainbow colors, but nothing uh, that represents necessarily represents black people. Per se. Okay, so let's do this. Let's stick to the interview and okay. what went on with the interview, okay? Because we don't want to get sidetracked. Because what I'm trying to figure out is that, one, I didn't, I don't have any expectation. I talked about this earlier in the show, so you might have missed this. I don't have any expectation that the Breakfast Club is a place for political advocacy. To me, they're an entertainment platform. So I don't expect my entertainers to be my political advocates. But so, the entertainers okay, are used. Okay, but I'm talking okay. about myself. Okay. So I don't expect any entertainer to be my political advocate because I haven't expressed to the entertainer what my political terms are. <laughs> and I don't control that entertainer, so then they therefore they can't be my so I don't have a relationship with an entertainer to where here's what my political terms are. And then if you don't uh, address or advocate on my political terms, here's what's going to happen to you. I don't have that kind of relationship with any entertainer. So I just think to where we are not we do. Well, I think so many people I'm not talking about you personally are unsophisticated on how polit politics actually works is one. They believe that entertainers are their political advocates. And two, they believe that when a politician comes on a platform, the goal is to listen to the politician as opposed to put terms on the table and ask the politician, can he meet those terms? Or she. Okay, I understand. And you're very aware, but majority of the uh, of people that I met and even in my coworkers that work, they're not as versed or as aware as you. So they really took everything as for face value. Well, that's why they're going to keep being uh, politically marginalized. So if the only way that this group of people that are politically unsophisticated can ever become politically empowered is for entertainers and entertainment platforms to not advocate on them politically, it's never going to happen because that's not the goal of the platform. I'm saying that's not the goal of the platform, but that's the, the goal of, of a lot of people of my, you know, my community there. I see when they watch the breakfast club, because that's all they go to the breakfast club for entertainment, get the latest, on uh, politics and gossip. Okay, so if that's what they go for, then why why would there now be the expectation that that's going to be a space for political advocacy? Um, you, you brought a valid good point, but again, um, many of our people aren't as versed into other forms of medium, so they depend on the more the more popular sources of medium such as the Breakfast Club. And, you know, take their snippets and move on and come to work and share the talking points. Okay. So do you think that the, the I think her name is Teslin, she didn't allow Vivek to get off his talking points? You think that was incorrect for her to not to do that? It was her interview and she got it the way she felt it was it should have gone but it didn't go to me it didn't go right it went it was a disaster so what direction should it have gone in if it didn't go right in your opinion 
I think, first of all, again, uh, one of the concerns was her accent about fifth grade, sixth grade uh, involvement. I think that was a bit too much. Mm-hmm. I think she should, like, yeah, she should have talked about more of if you were to run as president or become in a political position, how would you benefit the community at large? Because this is a black themed show. Uh, and also, also provided some, ba- you know, some basic political education to the population at large who may not be as versed. Okay, so let me ask you a question, and I'm just interested in understanding this. Okay. When speaking to a politician, why would the question be what the politician is going to do? Like an open question, like what? It's almost like a, a beauty uh, a beauty pageant question. Why would the questioning be? very open-ended as to what are you going to do for the black community as opposed to here's what we want and do you have the ability to provide it so basically making a demand or request off the the bricks exactly that's called political advocacy again i know okay that's a good question but the thing is what i feel is though because of who sponsors the breakfast club i don't think they would necessarily allow it to come from that angle okay so i understand that but then what i'm asking you is that if you believe that she should have took the angle of well what are you going to do for the community it do you believe that to be the right angle for her to take because i prefer her to take the angle that she did take than to sit there and let that guy bloviate and come up with a and craft a whole bunch of narratives and do a a, a lecture style you know essentially where because what he tried to do with them is he tried to play high man and get them to play low man we learned about that in screenwriting what Tesla did was didn't allow him to make her the low man. And I'm saying that from a unisex standpoint. And so that's what most people are used to with politicians. So then because he couldn't play high man and make her play low man, he no longer had a leg to stand on because that was the only pretty much the only card he had on the table because he's a debater. So my thing is that if we don't feel that she did the correct thing, why are we asking her to do something that's still not based on a political advocacy? You have a right to your opinion. I'm just trying to figure out why we have so many people that don't really believe in political advocacy, but they want something out of politicians. Well, the only way to get something out of politicians is to have political advocates that demand things out of politicians. And I think I think I agree with you in that point. That will require, from my perspective, we as a community to reorganize ourselves and come up with an agenda for ourselves and stick to it like other groups do we, we really don't have anything that's solid we can't even come up with a um a plan even for reparations and but we're screaming reparations but we don't have a direct plan i mean that's a whole nother topic for another day um yeah i do think we need some reorganization as a people okay well, I appreciate- we are people and, and that's another mistake I think we make we make is that we understand we need us and we are people whether we like it like it or not. And so therefore all the way we can advocate for ourselves is to, you know for us to come together as a people to promote our needs and the story and and uh so because like Vivek uh he stood his ground. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I, I can't wait till next week to, for the next topic. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Let me go ahead and get that back. All right. Let me get this next comment out. Appreciate it from uh, Michelle. Let me get this next comment out. Doom, doom, doom. Oh. Yeah, GC says fake backstory about his parents just came in with no money, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I feel you. You know, them people got money over there. Right? So Spark says the 20th Amendment is in his proposal fake. That's what I thought. There is no 20th Amendment. So I don't know what it is, what he's in support of, but you know, like I say, nobody ain't gonna never check it. So Donna Watts says, Tesla pointed out two things. He's not educated on even the things he's trying to implement. And it's important to vote in politics with a track record for high offices. Yeah, 
but this is the thing though, Donald. I don't think there's going to be a 37 year old president or a 38 year old president inside of the United States. They're saying that DeSantis is too young to be president. The guy's in his mid 40s. So I don't know why they're going to take Vivek seriously on the Republican side. Well, they're telling DeSantis, you're a good candidate. You're just too young. He's mid 40s. Because on the national level, mid 40s is your baby. That's what messed up Rubio. You know, Rubio wanted to be president, but when he started trying to get some traction, he was mid 40s. Everybody else was way, way older than him, so they went with the senior people. DeSantis is going to have that same issue, and they're telling him that. But yet, the 37 year old is the, is the guy. Just don't make no sense. But he's able to speak to the millennials because they're in the same age group. So I think that's kind of what he's, you know, he's marketing towards. Okay, we're going to get you up out of here. It's funny how people, they do stuff to get one comment and they just done. Yeah, Roscoe says, I remember reading something about people not being able to move up in the caste system. Exactly. Hope to be reincarnated to a higher caste. So that's why I said, if he believes in that and he's an adherent to that particular system, why are you going to come to me and talk about meritocracy? So if we was in India, it wouldn't be no meritocracy. I'd be lower caste because I wouldn't be a Brahmin. I'm not light-skinned enough. So that's what I'm trying to say is that it's just weird that people are buying this, but it is what it is. You know, six says light skin and white eight skin is at the top. Yeah, definitely. They are because they're Indo, they're Indo-Aryans. See, that's people that gotta realize that really the in India, they're really different ethnic groups. But they don't really want people to know that just because they're all in one country. So the Brahmins are really uh Indo-Aryans. The other people are not Indo-Aryans, but that's you know, we ain't trying to get into a, a, a deeper conversation. So really, what we call India really is filled with different ethnic groups and they built that caste system to put Indo-Aryans at the top and we believe the Indo-Aryans were the people that invaded that region thousands of years ago when there was nothing but darker skinned people in that region of the country or the region of the world I'm sorry but we're not having an anthropology discussion so Dr. K says I'm out here near Silicon Valley the money remains in house I believe you I believe you 100% So uh, Ron says he's a master debater and it doesn't require commitment to any stance. Exactly. I know another guy who was a master debater. He come out of political space, too. And he told me he would argue a, a point that he didn't even believe in just to get good at doing that type of stuff. Because he says a master debater got to be able to argue every other point, argue opposite points. And he told me that. So uh, I know what this guy's doing. He don't believe this stuff he's saying, but he can debate it really well. So Ron says, I won every debate I was in. I dislike the idea that I could win even when representing beliefs I, I personally disagree with. Yeah, that's what they make you do. You got to do the same thing in politics, though. They'll tell you to stump for something that you don't necessarily believe in because they just want to put your face on it. Yeah, definitely. He was a decent speaker in high school. Yeah, he's a really good speaker, which helps him because speaking is a leadership skill, right? So it, it really does help. But his voice is performative. That's not his real voice. I don't believe for a second he speaks like that inside his house. It's very performative. So Katrina says, recognize this game being shared. Appreciate it. So she says, my son went to a Jesuit school. They pound that theology. Yeah, they should. I mean, it's their school. I get it. You know? So what I'm saying is that it's impressive that he's so committed to being Hindu that even though he went to that school for four years, he didn't come out a Catholic. 
So it goes to show you how much he believes in being a Hindu, right? Because he didn't switch up. So GC says there's an inside joke in Silicon Valley that if Peter Thiel likes you, you become worth 100 million before you're 40. I believe you. He the one reason why Zuck's sitting on billions of dollars. So Sam Altman is also Peter Thiel protege as well as Paul Graham. Okay, I got to check them out. So Dr. K says parents probably pay the tuition. Admissions loves immigrant students as they pay the year up front. I feel you. I don't know. I ain't going, you know, I, I couldn't get into none of them private schools. I had to go to a state college. So Vic says uh, the Breakfast Club shouldn't run circus so easily. He don't do too well on his feet. Yeah, a lot of these people, if you, if they can't stay on program, they struggle. And I've noticed that, especially on the right, with a lot of their quote unquote thought leaders. Everything has to be very like strict for them. You know, if they have to get off program, they struggle because they're really good. A lot of them are just good at reading a teleprompter, and they're good at you know we saw it with uh. I'm not going to say her name because I don't even want to get into it. But they're very good at just reading programs. So once he couldn't play high man, and once they often, and another thing, they didn't turn it racial, which is what he wanted to do, so he can get his, his sound bites. Once they couldn't turn it racial, he didn't have a, a leg to stand on. And so that's what I'm saying is that even though he's a very intelligent person, he's stuck on a script. So Katrina says, it's not diverse in military leadership, especially in Army combat arms to war fighters. I feel you. So Jay says she was rude and talked over him the whole time. Okay, same again, JC. Man, you could come on and tell us what she should have done if you get a chance, bro. Okay, so I see you just with trolling. So we're going to get you out of here. Appreciate it, though, man. Yeah, Dr. K, you're 100% correct. A lot of people can't get that, and they're looking at the wrong people, but you're 100% correct. Uh, plants are chosen in childhood. They shape their lives accordingly. You're 100% correct. A lot of people can't get that, and then they do. They look at the wrong people. The people they think are the plants are not the plants. The plants is the people that's they can't see the ones that's right in front of them because the ones that's right in front of them is telling them everything that they want to hear. But yeah, you're 100% correct. They they do this stuff so far out. Um. People would be able to blow their mind, but the average person doesn't even get exposed to it because of their social circle. So the only time they may think about it is like when we have a national election, but it's even deeper than that. It's also on the state level. But yeah, this stuff is 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 deeper than what people think, because this whole system is planned out. I tell people all the time when I used to train traders and I still do. Is that the reason why you haven't been taught how to manage capital is because that was never supposed to be your role in this society. Right. Because we have an economic caste system here and also a social caste system. It's not based on religion. So the reason why you would never talk these things and you're supposed to hand this off to somebody else and they're supposed to make all those decisions in that area because it was never supposed to be your job. You're not even supposed to ask certain type of questions about capital. So you ask somebody, the average person in America, uh, what's the acceptable rate of return on capital for you? They can't even answer the question because they're not supposed to know the answer to that question. They're supposed to go about what somebody else tells them. So this stuff is very much planned, but you can't run a society without planning it out. It's just to me how you plan it out, but you're hundred percent correct.
So Ice Cube had a contract with Black America. So again, Black America Television News and Information, Ice Cube's not my political advocate, right? I won't let an entertainer be my political advocate. Big up to Cube, great entertainer, right? Big time entertainer, good, good movie guy, you know, very talented guy, hell of a writer. Uh, I won't let an entertainer be my political advocate. So I, my critique of Cube is who's his group, right? Because how are you a political advocate and you don't have a group? So it should have been difficult. It should it, They should not have been able to run over Cube if he had a group and not just him by himself. So that's that's my thing. But one, I don't let entertainers be my political advocate. Two, who's Cube's group? What is he organized around? You see what I'm saying? So because you come into an organization, which is really a gang, these two political parties are gangs. You can't show up somewhere where a gang is controlling the situation and you all by yourself and think they're going to give you any action. It don't work that way. So if we play in politics, the question needs to be, who is Cube connected to, to where if we play with Cube, it's going to go bad for us. If they can't answer that question, they don't have to deal with Cube because who was he? See, so we let's, let's say, so we doing real politics. The reason why I connected myself to certain people. So when I'm moving around, if something happened to me, something going to happen to them. Because I can't stop nobody from doing something to me because I'm not Superman. I'm not bulletproof. But I knew because of the work I put in, if you do something to me, something going to happen to you. And you know that, too. So that's what kept people off of me. If you're not moving like that in this game, anything can happen to you. Because why? Nobody's worried about what's going to happen to me if I do something to you. That's how the game works. The game don't work no other way. That's how the game works. So if they can play with Cube and nothing going to happen to them, that's how it's going to work. Because who was Cube? Who was he? A rapper? They don't care about that. Some of the most wealthiest people in the world are members of the Democratic Party. Why do they care about an entertainer? Who was he? That's how the world works. But big up the Cube, man. Cold entertainer. Can't take nothing from him. I see Buddy Jay Green kept posting. Boy, these people wild. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Dr. K, I, years ago, I found out uh, like who the Bushes really were. It was some deep stuff. So I see why they where they at. But I didn't know. But I had done some research on who the Bush family really was. So I see why everything. Because I told people years ago, you don't become director of the CIA and you don't know people. And that's why Vivek's saying, I'm going to get rid of these federal agencies like the FBI. You ain't going to get rid of nothing. You don't know who these people are. They'll get rid of you first. But it sounds good because he knows there's a, a, a segment on the right that are mad about this judicial or legislative movement, really judicial movement against Trump. So I can get traction by saying I'm going to get rid of the FBI. No, you're not. You don't get rid of them. They'll get rid of you. You think all these FBI agents are going to let you get rid of their organization that they eat off of? Life don't work that way. But it sounds good to that to that movement. But yeah, you 100 percent correct. I did some information on where the Bush family really came from. It was some deep stuff. I see how dude got to be directed to CIA and how his son got to be president. He was president too. Whole family was up there. All right, man. So we're gonna get up on out here. Appreciate everybody for coming through. Don't want to hold you too long, but I want to really encourage you. Make sure that you just don't buy these people on face value and also encourage you to get some political advocacy. The only person on this YouTube that really talks about political advocacy is Yvette Carnell. I'm not a fan of everything she does. I think she's kind of reckless in the way in which she communicates to people. But that's me. We, me and Yvette from different environments and we come out of different structures. But one thing I will give her credit for is she talks about the importance of political advocacy. And that's something that many of us as black people, ADOS, whatever you want to call it, FBA, we don't know it. We don't know what it looks like. So we don't know what we're missing. And what they've done is they've they have uh, become so successful at denying us political advocacy and it's worked. They're not rolling this out to the larger population. And America eventually going to look like the rest of the world to where 99% of the people in the world in America have no political advocacy. And all the political advocacy is going to the 1%. But they've taught the 99% that that's just how the world's supposed to go because that's how the world works for 
the, the majority of the world, the majority of the world has no political advocacy, right? So you do stuff like let politicians sit in front of you and just talk. There is nothing to talk about. Here's what we want. Here's my group. And either you're going to get it for us or you're not. Right? This, why would I talk to a politician for two hours about what they have to talk about? I don't care what you got to talk about. I care what I have going on. That's political advocacy. And then you have people that are representing you in that particular area. And it's their job to go to politicians and to make sure that your group gets what we want. Or here's going to be the downside of we not getting what we want. It got to be bigger than an Internet campaign. But when you don't have any political advocacy, you don't know what it looks like. You never had anything. It can be difficult to get the masses of people to understand the benefit of it because why? They live their whole life without it. So you entertain guys like Vivek. And not only does this happen to black folks, it's also going to happen to working class white folks because the goal is to strip 99% of Americans out of any kind of political advocacy. Right. That's what these guys are really advocating for while talking about meritocracy and all this other stuff, because they already up. So they don't care about nobody else. Hope you all have some got some value from it. Like I said, man, we don't do right or left. I don't care what you are. I'm a buccaneer. I came in a buccaneer. I was born on the water. I was born literally on the island. Just understand that. Yeah, I was born on land. I was born on the island in the, in, I was really born in the bay for real. I'm a real buccaneer. Spent more time in the water than most of y'all go ever spend. Probably spent more time in the water before I was 10 than most of y'all going to spend the rest of y'all life. I don't do Democrat. I don't do none of that stuff. Right? Those are football teams. I'm a fan of the Bucks because I'm a Buccaneer. So please miss me with all of the, you a leftist, you a this, you a that. No, I'm a Buccaneer. Right? And you should come down to Florida and see what Buccaneer is, how we really live and if you can really handle it. Right? So y'all have a good weekend, man. Y'all stay safe. Y'all keep it pushing. But I want to really encourage you, man, to educate yourself on what's going on around you. Don't take things on face value. And don't let people just talk you to death around what they're going to do. And you don't put what you want to do on the table. Right? Talk to you later.